get to it. I was going to do a little thing on it. Uh, it goes on. Jesus peacefully but determinate, determinately challenged the man accusing a woman of adultery, John 8, when on the night before he died, he asked Peter to put down his sword, Matthew 26. Neither passive nor weak. I mean, this is, I don't know, as I was reading this at 4 a.m. this morning, I'm like, wow, this is, I mean, when, when uh, Brian told me yesterday about this, I was like, you know, this is incredible. These people are putting us to shame, or me, in that instance. Get this, neither, so Jesus was neither passive nor weak. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Jesus' nonviolence was the power of love in action, which is mm -hmm. sung a, a hymn, uh, loving something, what was the last line there? Uh, in vision and deed, he is the revelation and embodiment of the nonviolent God. Clearly, I mean, this is incredible. Clearly, the Bible and the witness of Jesus should never be used to justify violence, injustice, or war. I mean, I'm getting excited. This is the Catholic Church, people. Well, that's the, what's this right is there. right. That, that this is the the mm -hmm. church that had not one Inquisition. They had many. Right. I don't that's think people saying. know this, but they had many Inquisitions. We confess that the people of God have betrayed this central message of the gospel many times, <laughs> participating in wars, persecution, oppression, exploitation, discrimination. We believe that there is no, quote, just war. <laughs> let, me, let me read that again. We believe with the Catholics no, this, we well, tax Christie, which is a tiny fraction. Well, it, it's a, <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. Catholics, though. Yes, but they, not, the Catholic. not the church. No. Not the whole church. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we believe that there is no just war. Too often, the just war theory has been used to endorse rather mm -hmm. than prevent or limit war, mm -hmm. suggesting that a just war is possible also undermines the moral imperative to develop tools and capacities for nonviolent transformation of conflict. That's another key line. We need a new framework that is consistent with gospel nonviolence. We propose the following. Then they give recommendations. So what's his only? Why are we here? They said to themselves for three days. And I got the point, there, Sarah. A couple of points. To continue teaching communities on nonviolence. Yeah. To practice nonviolence in our own lives. Yeah. Wow. What? Practice nonviolence in my own life. To promote nonviolent practices and strategies. For example, nonviolent resistance. Whoa. Unarmed civilian protection. Hmm, interesting. Conflict transformation. Peace building strategies. Second point. To initiate a global interfaith conversation in and out of religious institutions. Could you imagine? Yeah. Churches out there going, hey guys, you know what? The church actually, we're not, we're not for war, yeah. we're not for weapons, we're not for, uh, you know, you strike me, I strike. No, I mean, <laughs> revolutionary. Last, to no longer use or teach just war theory. Okay. Yes, it's a small group within yeah. Catholicism, but it's a big voice nonetheless. The Pope addressed this group, and the Pope said. I, I, of course I agree. Love, you know, the, the, uh, Pope Francis, the monk, etc. I'll finish with this. Uh, thanks, Anton, for this time. I'll finish with this. Second Corinthians 1. Mm. Brothers and sisters. This is a paraphrase, by the way. I, lo I love paraphrases. Mm -hmm. I'm up all night sometimes trying to put paraphrases together. <laughs> Second Corinthians 1, 8. Brothers and sisters. This is Paul. We want you to know. Get this. Paul wants them to know of the troubles that we went through in Asia. We were crushed, overwhelmed, beyond our ability to endure. We thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. Interesting. They stopped relying on themselves and learned to rely only on God. I can picture Paul. They're going into uh, savage tribes, uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. They're going into 
dangerous places. Am I going to defend it myself violently? No. I'll stop relying on myself and I'll trust in God, right? Because God is sending me here. Why? Because God raises the dead. Uh, I mean, anyway. he did this. So he did, and he did rescue us, said Paul, from mortal danger. He will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, God. He will continue to rescue us. You are helping us by praying for me mm. or us. Mm. Many, if you do this, says Paul, many people will give thanks mm. because God has graciously answered so many prayers mm -hmm. for our safety. Mm. I'll end with the Lord Jesus. Mm. John 16. I have told you all this so that trusting me, remember John 14, trusting God, trust those who in me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace in this present evil age. You will continue to experience trouble and suffering, but take heart, I have conquered the world. John 13. Mm -hmm. So now, okay, so now, I am giving you, not Moses, mm. I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. <clears throat> this is how you will prove to the world that you are my disciples because you have such love for one another. Uh, I think it's not easy, it's difficult. Don't ask my wife how I battle the flesh in terms of you know violence and things like that, but I think the church, we need to wake up, not just to the Trinity, not just to eternal hell, people burning forever and ever, not to, just to all those other foundational things, but to me this is at the core, what good is it Paul said, if I have prophecy, if I have tongues, if I have one God, what good is it if, if I hold to the things of this world regarding war, regarding, you know, uh, violent, mm -hmm. violence and so on. So, yeah, I hope. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very much an Anabaptist statement. Our Sicinian friends, Sicinians are those who believe in the, Jesus as we do. And some of them died for that truth. The women, I want to tell you, were thrown into the river with sacks around their necks and weights. I'm not kidding. That's exactly our Daniel 3.17. There's a God in heaven, our one Lord, Iskirios, who will save us. And he did. So they heated the fire, seven times hotter. They were thrown in there and there was an angel walking among them and their clothes were not even singed or burned. So I, th I think that is a powerful message. It may be that we are weak because we are not stressing this enough. It's entirely possible. So yes, we'd better be doing it right because not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, but only those who do the will of the Father will be in the kingdom, period. So work on that. It's a good message. We'll have to have that yeah, recorded just, again. I have to you say, say this yeah. so-called just war yeah. is what has happened to the unborn. Yes. Mm. The most innocent yeah. and defenseless human beings right. Ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have used that same uh, philosophy of dehumanization mm -hmm. in order to kill them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is exactly right. It's calling itself just peace. Yes. I don't know the, what call, I sorry. Just that peace. Yeah. That's an adjective. Just peace instead right. of just That's war. That's the reason why it's there. Yes. 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 not new. That's a Catholic group. I think very tiny, but let's hope their message spreads. We can talk to them. Let's just say we're behind you on that point. Mm. Pax Christi is just, not just war, just peace. It, there are pacifist elements in most denominations. Dan Gill shared with me the other day that the UPC, the United Pentecostal Church, out of which he came, they were conscientious objectors. I didn't know that. We know the Quakers are, and so there are elements in every faith. There are non-violent elements in all the faiths, so that's just encouragement. All right, so back to Luke then. Luke in the 19th chapter. I suppose I shouldn't spoil everything by telling you that Jesus said bring my enemies in front of me and kill them work on it 
That's the other side of the story. What Paul said is 100% true. What Jesus said there is also 100% true in two different situations. So you don't want to wind up as an enemy of Jesus ultimately because he's going to execute you. That's the justice of God. Vengeance is mine. I will repay and he will. Anyway, that's an interesting subject. Glad you aired that. Luke number 19 then. We start at the college in our gospel as kingdom class by pointing out that this is probably the ideal place to begin. One of the many places where you can begin to show people the central truth of the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, I'll read 19.1 and ask uh, anybody on my right who's reading, you're going to be reading, uh, verse 2, and then round the room if you feel like it. This is the New American Standard Version, a good, a good version. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Mm -hmm. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short from stature, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. <laughs> then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what was lost. Great story. I cannot comment on the tree. It's a mulberry tree. I have no <laughs> idea what that is. Maybe <laughs> Darwin is. It's a mulberry tree. It's a sturdy tree with low hanging branches. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that a small person could get in yeah. and out. It must be easy to climb. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting because the NSV margin has literally a fig mulberry. So, a fig I can relate to. We have fig trees out here. <laughs> Whatever it was, it doesn't matter. The story is precious, humorous, isn't it? How tall was he? Five foot one and a half. Poor little guy. He was a tax collector and he was a rogue. Uh, we have uh, tax experts among us here who are not rogues. <laughs> but uh, this one was, as many of them were, making a quick buck off the system, obviously. They were regarded as sinners. And of course, Jesus got his critics, right? They love to criticize. He shouldn't be mixing with those rotten people. That's typical. That's the Pharisaic, better than you approach to life. But I like the excitement here. He ran on ahead and climbed up the, the sycamore tree. Ran on. He was really moving here. He wanted to see who Jesus was, and I do too. I want to know who is Jesus? What did he stand for? I need the truth there. I'm very anxious to see him. And Jesus said, I need to be visiting you today. I like that. Stay at your house. This is, you know, metaphors also, picture language, as well as being literally true, all sorts of echoes, right? I want to stay in your house. I want to come and be uh, one with you and so on. He hurries, came down and received Jesus gladly. And you could say, you've done that too. You've received Jesus <coughs> gladly. So all sorts of uh, echoes of this literal story. When they saw it, they began to complain. Yes, those silly critics, right? They couldn't handle it. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. A sinner, you see, was anybody who wasn't doing the law properly. So they divided the society into two. The people who were performing the law under the Pharisaic uh, instructions, doing it precisely, and those wretched tax collectors who were in league with an evil system. They were bad guys. Zacchaeus stopped, said to the Lord, the Lord Jesus, that is, Kyrios, Behold, Lord, what was he doing here? Wasn't he repenting? You don't get forgiveness without repentance, very important. Or this idea that you're great, you're great, move on without repentance is not the way the Bible does it. You have to repent. Even when Jesus said, Forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. He didn't say they don't have to repent, they do. Everybody has to repent before God. Eventually. Now, we don't hold grudges against our enemies, that's true. But it's uh, rather illusory to imagine that you can proceed without any repentance. This man understood, he repented, 
and he actually tried to make everything good, didn't he? Even the prodigal son, remember the prodigal son, had to fall on his knees and beg for forgiveness. The dad was willing to have him back, but he wouldn't have come back if he had not been reduced to almost nothing and then brought to repentance. That's going to happen to Israel too. It can happen to all of us. But Israel, the nation, is going to go through a terrible period of suffering, Zechariah 13, 14, and through that terrible suffering, they will be brought back to God so that a remnant will say to Messiah when he comes, blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. That's to say the Messiah coming representing. They're going to say, yes, we now see that you are the Messiah and we accept you. But it's going to take suffering. So if you are being tried and, and tribulated in some way, it can be that one is being refined, right? And one is a better person at the end of it all. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. To be a son of Abraham is what we all need to be, right? If you are Abraham's seed, you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, other way around, if you're a Christian in Galatians 3.29, then you count as the seed of Abraham. You are the Jews, you're the true circumcision now. Yes, there's a future for national now blinded Israel. We know that, that's an important truth of the future. But for the moment, don't throw away your identity to an unconverted Jew. Jesus said of some of those Jews, your father's actually the devil. You're not the seed of Abraham at all, because unless you accept Messiah, you're not in that happy condition. This man then is a striking example of somebody who has accepted Messiah, and then he is a true son of God. He's the Israel of God, Galatians 6.16, not the Israel of the flesh, First, what's that? First Corinthians 10, 18. The Israel of the flesh, that's national, um, biological Israel, right? They're, they're the bad guys right now. You are the Israel of the flesh. The true circumcision, Philippians 3, 3, that's easy. You're the true Jews. You are the true Jews because you have the heart of Messiah. For well, the Son of Man, from Daniel 7, the human being. Isn't it interesting that Jesus calls himself the human being, you get it? Not half God, half man, not God and man together. The human being, Psalm 101, the Adonai, my Lord of Psalm 101, most important. So he's the son of man who has come to see, I like that seeking, don't you? He's actually actively on a search committee. God is too. God is seeking those who will serve him. Jesus is doing it as well. Oh. The eyes of the Lord, we had last week, marvelous text, the eyes of the Lord somewhere in Second Chronicles, the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro in the world to see, you know, who could I use? So it's not a fait accompli, it's not all over because he's watching. What sort of a person is this, right? Sometimes God doesn't know. He's chosen not to know. He watched Abraham. He asked him to sacrifice his son. And he said, now I know what sort of a person you are. Because Abraham passed the resurrection test. He said, okay, I know I have to have a son for the promises. Well, okay, I'm supposed to put him to death. How about that? I have to do it. Of course, God can raise him from the dead, and that's what Hebrews says. Isn't that marvelous? He passed the resurrection test. So, if you're one of those three men about to be thrown into the lake of fire, and not the lake of fire, but the fire furnace, the lake of fire, no, no, misspoke there, into the fire furnace, still, there's a God, our one Lord, who can rescue us. So death is not the end for Christians. A comment. Okay, what have we got? Uh, it's actually Second Chronicles sixteen nine. Yes, Second Chronicles sixteen nine. Sixteen. For the eyes of the Lord yep. run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Yes. Isn't to it give good? strong support to those whose heart yes. is blameless toward Him. Yes. Yeah. Great text, isn't it? The eyes of the Lord watching your day to day activities, the struggles you're going through and so on. The eyes of the Lord are running, nice picture, running all over the world through his angels and other associates to watch out for those whose hearts are blameless, not sinless people exactly, but they're blameless in terms of their simple faith in God. Randy uh, online Randy, says yes. that verse 10, yes. the Son of Man is searching, mm -hmm. is a purpose statement yes. on par with uh, Luke 4.43. Yes, good. 
that says, uh, I am divinely compelled to right. go to other towns also to preach the gospel exactly. about the kingdom. That's this is why wonderful. I was commissioned. So it's That's terrific. Cool. It's a purpose statement. One, God's activity, what he busies himself with day by day, is searching and looking. Actually, it's John 4 which says that God is doing that. The Father is doing that too. Isn't that right, John 4? Let's throw that verse in to the hub of verses. God is seeking people to worship him in spirit and truth. Where is that? In John 4? Seeking. God is seeking. Where is he doing that? 23. 23. An hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father is seeking. He's looking out for them, he's not looking out for them, looking for them, he's on a search committee, I suppose, to say, hey, I could use this person. Now I'm going to have to test them now to see what they're really made of. So that is John 4, 23. But you've got to be worshipping in spirit and truth. That's most important. The spirit and truth are tightly linked there. Spirit, truth, worship. Not just spirit. But the spirit of truth, says so John 4, 23 and 24. Can I ask you how? Yeah. But an hour is coming, yes. and now is. Yes. <clears throat> well, that's nice. 4, 24. Let's, look, let's read that again. An hour is coming, and now is. That's the, the future and the present, isn't it? Yes. yes. I don't know. I imagine he's got this huge salvation thing of the future in mind, you know, when, when the world will accept him. Mm -hmm. But it started now. It's the presence of the kingdom and the future, maybe. Probably that famous theme, you know, in Bible study is the, the not yet and the already. It hasn't happened massively yet, but it's happening, I suppose, already now in small version. I, I would think so. An hour is coming and now is. So it's both things, future and present. Best I can do with that. I think that's what the commentators probably would say. It's in embryo, absolutely, in embryo. Why not? In embryo. So right. the kingdom so, is among you. Or of course, the kingdom is among you. It's it's, but it's, here, yes. yes, you ain't seen, it's my Georgian, you ain't seen nothing yet, right? I learned that from you, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you ain't seen <laughs> nothing yet. This is remarkable. We've got, you know, a few people. But wait till you see crowds, the whole nation. Wait till you see Assyria, the whole nation, my people. Wait till you see Isaiah says, uh, Israel, my people. Egypt. Egypt, my people. The whole nation is worshipping God. That's not yet. <laughs> but it's going to happen. That's when the devil will have been bound. And right now, Revelation 12, 9 says, the devil is deceiving the entire world. He's the god of this present evil system. So you would expect to find him pretty active everywhere. I suppose that might account for the fact that since breakfast this morning, 1,600 babies have been murdered in their mother's wombs. Now, that's just a st boring statistic. What? First of all, those women weren't pre pregnant for good reasons, probably, in many cases. Some exceptions, yes. So that was a, a big, big fault. That's going to stop in the kingdom. Secondly, should you ha have a child uh, you, you don't think to take care of, there are people longing to adopt them. But for some doctor to use the forceps, and I mean, this is unspeakably bad. We have to pray that God has mercy on this nation and any nation that's doing that, poor thing. Okay, that's another subject. Now we get to the part of Luke, which to me is just devastatingly interesting in terms of the kingdom. Look at this. Verse 11, <coughs> turn to read. I think it's nice. Okay, okay. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable mm -hmm. because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Okay. He said once there was a nobleman who left home to go to a distant country to be given a kingdom and then re to return. Mm -hmm. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minus and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, <laughs> We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, the king called in his servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what they had done with the money 
and what their profits were. The first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten mina <coughs> He said to them, 17, well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing, you are now to be in authority <coughs> over ten cities. Eighteen. Eighteen. That would be okay. The second came, saying, your mina master has made five mm -hmm. minas. The king said, I am now putting you in charge of five cities. Yes. Another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. Mm. For I was afraid of you, because you're an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. You wicked servant, the king roared. Hard am I if you knew so much about, uh, about me and how, how tough I am. Yes, verse 23. Then why did you not put my money in the bank? Mm -hmm. And having come, I would have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. Mm -hmm. And he said to him, Master, he has ten mina already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. 27. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Gentle Jesus, make and mild. Uh, Georgia Harkness wrote a book on the kingdom of God. She's a lady theologian. She said, this verse could not have come from Jesus. He couldn't have said that. I smiled at that many years ago. So the lady's selective, right? She'll take the bits of scripture th she thinks fit her image of Jesus. That this one had to be an interpolation. Jesus could not have said that. Well, you are naive Bible believers, unlike the wicked professional system out there that picks and chooses. From my angle, I have to accept the scripture. Bring them in my, into my presence and execute them in my presence. Whoa. This Jesus, I, I can see why people love the Gospel of John and Paul. It's a little bit easier than this stuff, isn't it? Can you handle this? Do you read this often? Have you got these verses on the fridge? Pretty tough stuff. I'm, I'm sort of shaking in my boots as I read this. Wow, you know, what sort of a teacher is this? So, here's the point about the kingdom. That part is easy, at least. While they were listening to these things, why? Well, they were listening to the words about salvation, you see. They were saying, as a kid, you're going to be saved, you've done good. So that suggests the kingdom of God is about to appear, right? Salvation is related to the kingdom. So they then say, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus went on to tell them a story, a parable or a parallel, comparing one thing with another, because he was near Jerusalem, and they thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Now, for you guys, that is, of course, right. It's beautiful stuff, isn't it? It doesn't say because he was floating up towards the sky in a cloud, they thought that heaven was about to appear. Commentators do not like this verse at all. The typical reaction will be, those stupid Jews, didn't they know that the kingdom of God is not political, it's spiritual? This is what is, you don't read commentaries, I'm, I'm glad. Many of them are quite angry that these silly people should have imagined anything so crass and earthly and political as a real kingdom on the earth centered in Jerusalem. Right? They don't like that. Sean Finnegan gave a talk last year on your kingdom is too Jewish, meaning our view of the kingdom is too Jewish. Note the anti-Semitism, right? People don't like the Jews. They don't like the Jew Jesus. They don't like Semitic ways of thinking. Some of them even butchered Jews by the million, as you know. So watch out for anti-Semitism. If you're a Jesus person, you've got to love his teaching, love his Jewish way of thinking. So to me, this is wonderful stuff, because it shows that the kingdom of God was not in your heart, was it? They thought that he, the king was about to come. Why? Because he's in the proximity, say, say a few yards from Jerusalem. It's nothing to do with the kingdom in your heart. 
Although, of course, you can also say the kingdom has to be in your heart. But this is a geographical kingdom in Jerusalem. You can go there today and you will not find the Messiah ruling on the throne of David. Therefore, the kingdom of God has not come proprement dit. Properly speaking, it hasn't come. You can prove it by going there. Because the Lord God is going to give him the throne of his father, David. That is so Jewish, it's painful. Like it's the Old Testament, of course. So if you're not in love with the prophets of Israel and the Jewish teaching, if you don't get emotional about some of this, as our friend here was getting emotional, this should just pulsate in your heart. This is marvelous stuff. You just long for everybody to read this with the same joy that you're reading. So, I love that. The where, 11th verse. Where are they getting that idea from uh, this, this crowd? Well, from the, obviously from the salvation word that's just before, right? No, I meant, uh, sorry, the... the uh, uh, can you point to some of the prophets who are talking about oh. the kingdom in Jerusalem? Can like, where are they getting oh, this kingdom geographically can there? Do we, do we have five hours on here? Because <laughs> <laughs> a lot of quick bullet points. <laughs> well, five hours. Yes. Some it folded this from dawn till dusk. I'll give you an example. Go to <laughs> Jeremiah chapter three. <laughs> The whole biblical story, the land promise, the kingdom promise, is marvelous. So I'm glad you mentioned that. In Jeremiah chapter 3, you've got this sort of material. In chapter 3, you find Yirmiyahu, what Jeremiah. Uh, yes, let's look at uh, earlier than that. Verse 11, which, which verse is 17. 17, when Jeremiah 3. 17. 17. Yeah, even before that, in 11, the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel, that's blinded Israel, treacherous Judah, go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Faithless Israel, I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares Yahweh. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity. There's the repentance, you see. Acknowledge that you've been wrong, that you've transgressed, uh, transgressed against the Lord your God. You've scattered your favors, a sexual image here, to strangers under every green tree, every pagan religion, and you have not obeyed my voice. Salvation is about obedience. Hebrews 5, 9. Am I the only person in the world that quotes that? It's all about listening to what God says and doing what he says. So here's the, the good news of the kingdom coming. Return, O faithless sons, declares Yahweh. I am a master to you. I will take one from a city, two from a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. This is the kingdom of God. Then I will give you shepherds up to my own heart, feed you on knowledge. Ooh, head knowledge. Heaven forbid. Not, please, not head knowledge. Yes, knowledge and understanding. It will be in those days when you're multiplied and increased in the land, they will no longer say the Ark of the Covenant and so on. 17. At that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. This is the kingdom of God. We could, we could read literally for 10 hours and we wouldn't have touched the subject. The whole thing is about who gets the land, who gets the kingdom. So that's a marvelous passage. And here it says in 18, in those days, those famous days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel, the two tribes of the ten, and they will come together from the land of the north to the land that I gave your fathers as an inheritance. If you, if you have your Bible software, just ch check the word land, you know, her inheritance, fathers. It's all about giving the land to the right people. So that would be one. Then Jeremiah 23, just flick over. This is an example of what would be in their minds. In 23, 5, Behold, the days are coming declares the Lord, that I will raise up for David a righteous branch, that's a descendant, a branch, a branch of David, a messianic title, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and abolish abortion and righteousness in the land. Isn't that a happy, happy thought? I mean, it's just marvelous, isn't it? You can see the sunshine but you ain't seen nothing yet, <laughs> would be the comment on these passages. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely. 
And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. That's his name because that's what he does, acts for Yahweh and fulfills the righteousness of Yahweh. We won't read, I can, I'm tempted to read verse 9 of false prophets. Watch out. Jeremiah is incensed against false teaching. They put him, they lowered him into a mud hole. You remember that? He stood alone against the nation. So, I mean, etc. Micah 5, just go quickly there to make one more point. We could do this forever, but Micah 5, what about this? Micah 5, we've got um, <clears throat> the Messiah in verse 4, he will arise and shepherd his flock. Jesus is the, Jesus is the ultimate pastor. In the strength of the Lord, God is his strength. In the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. Oh, oh, Jesus has a God. Watch that one. One of Brian's favorite topics. <laughs> the Lord, his God. And they will remain because at that time, he will be great. That's Luke one thirty three. He will be great and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will be great to the ends of the earth. I don't see that right now. I don't see Jesus being great in North Korea or so much even in the West even. This one will be our peace. When the Assyrian, the Iranian, the Kurd maybe, a part of the Middle East, Persians, Iranians, Kurds, whatever this turns out to be. When he tramples on our citadels, then we'll raise against him seven shepherds and eight men, uh, leaders of men, and they will shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Babylon, Nimrod, and he, the Messiah, will deliver us from the Assyrian. Wow! That's the onslaught of the final enemy, you see? They're going to be punished by an enemy when he attacks, when he tramples on our territory. And then in verse 8, the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, among many peoples, like a lion. They're going to be on top. They'll be telling people what to do. And so on. So I mean, what you're saying is right. they don't have going to heaven. Well, that's, that's great too, um, of course. Mm -hmm. Nothing about going to heaven. Can I add this? It's interesting yeah. that even after the resurrection, yes. in Acts 1, yes. they're asking really the same question. Of course. Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't that interesting? Absolutely. Because there's a resurrection, yes. and they're still going, yeah, well, okay, that's great, Jesus. You know, yeah. you're back. So, so what do you but come on, cool. Acts 1. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's an interesting yeah. thing. No, it's it's what fascinating. Do, you do your job. Come on. Fascinating. It is interesting. And very simple. Why don't Jews accept Jesus? That's a common question. Because the kingdom wasn't established. If you're the Messiah, you rule in Jerusalem. It didn't happen. So therefore we cannot accept him. Now you are blessed to see that there was a first stage. He comes to die and to teach. And the second coming, he comes to rule. That's what we're going to try to unscramble on Saturday night at the conference. This has got to be clear. It's very simple in principle, isn't it? So the kingdom is everything but flying off to heaven, play hops and pink clouds. It's nonsense. Heaven in the Bible is nowhere the destination of the dying. And you could fool me, everybody says, well, when I get to heaven, won't heaven be wonderful? Nonsense, stop it. The Quran says, desist, don't talk about God being three. Shut up, sit down, don't say that. You can talk about the life of the age to come. I told them at the conference, drop the eternal life, it's not wrong, and maybe there's a place to use that. The life of the age to come. Blessed is the meek they are going to inherit the land. Jeremiah 27, 5 says that God will give the kingdom, the world. I created all this stuff, he says. The animals and the people. Every one of them I created, God says in Jeremiah 27, 5. And I'll give it to whoever I see fit to give it to. I like that. I make the decision here. It's a very easy story. Yes, please. Kate's going to say something. You mentioned that the hmm. Jews did not accept Jesus because of the kingdom. Yeah, largely, I think, but yes. Mm -hmm. I, wonder part about, mm -hmm. I wonder about, surely there were some rabbis that knew those prophecies. Oh, absolutely. So they just didn't have any influence, I guess. Well, you're, you're hitting a great point. It says there in John that many of them believed in Messiah Jesus, but they were scared of their jobs. That's what it says, and this has not changed today. It's exactly alike. Not only must you believe the truth, but you must stand up for it. And if your pastor, who is a Unitarian, suddenly becomes a Trinitarian, that's the time you walk out. But it doesn't happen. If your pastor suddenly decides to get remarried when he's not, no right to remarry, that's the time when you say no. Because if you side with the evil, you are evil. So we have to be very careful that our allegiance is honest, I think. Well, look at the only one who did. Yeah. 
believe Nicodemus. He goes at night. Good point. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. cre creeping, yeah. <laughs> creeping at night. Mm -hmm. hey, Jesus. It is. It's not easy. Is it? This is tough. But they, this is uh, really tough. Spiritualize away everything. I mean, like, what are you going to do? Reign over a spiritual city? You know, it's just, <laughs> and, and nobody wants a spiritual piece of apple pie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's a classic <laughs> line. <laughs> Did our audience get that? From That's awesome. One of them. That's great. I hope everybody heard that. Nobody wants a spiritual piece of I apple pie. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at these gorgeous azaleas here in Georgia. They're blooming on our creek. Uh, let's say they're just spiritual. They're spiritual. Spiritual. That is Platonism to the core. It is Plato who was in favor of the love of males with younger boys. Yes, he was. Whom they celebrate all the time. That's just wrong. And it's really the devil saying God's creation isn't so good. You want to get out, get out of it as soon as you can. And I yes. sure Kay reminded me about about this it. great paper uh, Sean Finnegan wrote, yeah. uh, looking for the historical Jesus yes. between evangelical and liberal scholarship. Uh, Sean likes a long time. Yeah. But there's a section here, you just reminded yeah. me, uh, where he says that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet. Yes, of course. A, a prophet of the end days, the a end prophet yes. preaching about the things mm -hmm. to come. Mm -hmm. And then he says here, I, I put up on the screen for people, Yes. Jesus was not concerned with many of the things that we might think he would be from our 21st century viewpoint. He did not tell people to accept him into their, their hearts so that they can go to heaven when they die. Jesus was not a Hawaiian shirt-wearing <laughs> mega pastor <laughs> who, through, who through seeker-sensitive methodology yes. befriended behaviorally challenged people <laughs> yeah and taught them to be nice to each other so that they could have a good afterlife. Yeah. No, Jesus was obsessed yeah. with the coming kingdom and repentance in light of it. That's good point. great. That's, that's, that's very good. <laughs> and now you mentioned Acts 1, 6. After he had lectured for six weeks, having come back from the dead, he then shows up daily with them for six weeks, 40 days, and he lectures on the kingdom. He speaks on the kingdom. He talks about the kingdom of God incessantly. So at the end of it they say, well isn't it great we're all going to heaven? <laughs> that is absolute nonsense. That's to reduce people to stupidity. They say, Lord, that's the Greek, impresses me so much, <laughs> like you know, when Jesus said, Abba, Abba, Father, they loved that. They heard him say it in Aramaic. When he said on the cross, why have you forsaken me? They remember the Aramaic. They said Maranatha, which is the Aramaic language of Jesus, because they're so impressed with that. Uh, we have parallels here. You have foreign languages. You, you are so when you get carried away, probably do. I've got again, my, you know. It's incredible to me, again, that yeah. if I had been there, yeah. X1, yeah. I would have, forget the kingdom, hey, eh? Jesus, I'd probably come back from the dead like you. Yeah. But there's still it's kings of people. Is this the time? I mean, it's not about, man, you got resurrection? How do I get resurrection? No, the question is, yep. no, geez, okay. It's all about the kingdom. I, mean, I suppose their heart is, they see the, the pitiful state of the world, don't they? Right. And it well, they it actually wrong. does break your heart. When you heard in Georgia last week, somebody took a dog, an innocent dog, we've got one lying on the floor right here, and put a concrete weight around its neck and strapped its and Judy's moved to tears almost by this, strapped its mouth shut with a piece of tape. That person will not survive in my kingdom, believe me. <laughs> that is so cruel. Can we not have a vestige of humanity for an instant animal? But people are wicked. If they don't repent. If they there repent. repent. <laughs> so I did an article, the first article I was ever, ever done, did publicly, I think in the Evangelical Court, it was published by Howard Marshall, it's called Acts 1 6 and the Restoration of the Kingdom. It's at our site, there, isn't it? I'm sure it is. Yeah, there's a link. There's a link to it, at least. It's called Acts 1 6, because that, that text then produced the fury of commentators. They said typically, those stupid disciples, they still think of a physical, political kingdom. Well, they just attacked my rabbi's students. You don't want to do that. And he didn't say anything like that. He simply said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, 
It wasn't a question of whether the king was coming. It's not for you to know the times, the stretches of time and the points of time. You don't know that. We don't know. He didn't know. But the question of the kingdom was quite clear. That's really good because on Saturday we'll be talking about this text in Matthew 24, 34, which says this generation will not pass until all these things happen. Oh, there you go, 40 years. The critics love that one. They think generation means 40 years, 70 years at the most, and Jesus was plain wrong because the kingdom didn't come in all of that nonsense. The world is not pleased with the Messiah. We're trying to promote his teaching. Okay, that's enough. What do you think of that text? Sir? That's really good. My then he gets My version, mm -hmm. I know, is a bit of a paraphrase. Yes. But in 11, it's very, very good. Yeah. Uh, because he was nearing Jerusalem, mm -hmm. he told a story to correct the impression yes. that the kingdom of God would begin right away. Mm -hmm. Would begin right away, to correct impression. That's really good. That's very good. Mm -hmm. Paraphrases have their place. There was another verse that you read, actually, this earlier, which left something up, but that verse is very, very good. So he said that Jesus is quite a teacher, isn't he? With his parables, his stories. A nobleman, that's himself, obviously, a nobleman. A royal person, and you are royal family. You are, all of you, royal family. A nobleman went to a distant country, obviously back to his father in heaven, to receive a kingdom for himself, and then return. What was that in your version in 12, brother? Yeah. Um, nobleman was called away to a distant yeah. empire to be crowned king and then return. Okay, to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Okay, so then that obviously shows <coughs> that he's the nobleman who is not going to establish the kingdom immediately, has to go off to heaven to get the authority to reign. He was in process of getting that authority, but he finally got it when he was exalted, you know, the ultimate final decision was certainly made, although from birth he was appointed to be king, we know all that, and then he's going to return, that's the second coming, that's Daniel 7, all of that, material you know so well. There was a local political event just like that, there was a, 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 a Roman ruler who had to go off to Rome to get the authority to rule in Palestine, so that would have made sense, rather as we talk about the election today, and we compare it with the election of, for the kingdom, right? There was a local event. It's in all the notes. Sarah has it in her, yeah, in her Bible. Like Archelaus or something? Um, so it's got well, it Herod the Great yes. also. Herod the Great. And he made a similar journey. That's right. Where he was crowned king of Judea. Yes. Although he was not able to claim his kingdom right. until, until years later. Right. And Archelaus. That's it. Archelaus, that's the guy. There are yes. parallels <laughs> in, in, the, in the politics of the day which they would have heard echoes. Actually, the, I had a question about this verse uh, 12. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus goes somewhere yeah. to get the kingdom yeah. and return. Of course. So, yeah. uh, to be crown king, I guess? So yeah, he's the right to rule. Just the yeah. right, to be given the right to rule yeah. and come back. Of course. Okay. He had it, of course, from start. Right. See, we ten, we tend, in our Western way, to say, is it here? Right. Or is it here? Or is it here? Chop it all up. No, it's the whole thing. It's that. You're right. You're right. Put it all together. So he gets confirmation, if you like. Not that he wasn't appointed king from Genesis 1. Of course, we know that. Not that he was alive then himself, but the promise, the seed of the woman was in view from the start. Just to okay. quickly, uh, you mm -hmm. said something about secret people secretly being disciples of Jesus. Another oh, yes. guy I'm reminded of is mm -hmm. uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea, Arimathea, Arimathea okay. who was also a secret, says John, a secret uh, because of his fear of the Pharisees. Private one. And then in, uh, yeah. in Luke, it says that uh, he took courage okay. to go in and meet mm -hmm. with Pilate mm -hmm. so he could get Jesus' mm -hmm. body. Yep. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, that, that move could have cost him his life, but sure. why did he do that? Yeah. It says because he was also waiting for, for the, the kingdom. kingdom of God. So the kingdom idea, the kingdom, he, he, you know, gave him courage mm -hmm. to, to do something that might have proven. Uh, Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And the they, blind man too. Yeah. Because people would have known that he was the one to do that. Right. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people, I they, mean, they it just makes sense that a lot of people mm -hmm. believe that, but, you know. I mean, because she's not going to right. stand up to him. 
And the point is that Jesus was just killed on a tree. Right. They so saw he's a false that. prophet. Yeah. So if this guy goes yeah. and claims the body of a false prophet, but the, say the kingdom thing, he's waiting for the. He was also it says waiting for the kingdom, but that drove him. Not, not Absolutely. Can you find the verse for us where it says that because of the Pharisees, uh, they were. Uh, I've got it actually. It's John third, John twelve forty two. After Jesus gave his final statement, public ministry forty two. That's John twelve forty two. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they weren't confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. It is so real. And to anybody out there who's scared, you know, what would my pastor say if I left? You jolly well better leave if you don't think your pastor has truth. You'll have to decide that, but you must stand up for the truth. Well, so that's John 12, 42. The following verse, they loved the oh, praise of men thank you. more than the praise and approval of God. Yeah. They uh, loved the praise of someone men. Someone just passed online, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You just answered it. Okay. Uh, the question, yep. the person said, can I stay with my pastor mm -hmm. if, they, if they keep uh, yeah. being a Trinitarian? I, I think that's so a fair question. My pastor, I'll be a little careful answer. that language. My shepherd, the one I look up to, it would be nice to have him agree with God and the King. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Enough on that. That's wonderful. Okay. The story then, now... Uh, Change the subject, and yet it packs in exactly what we need. He's getting the kingdom, and he's going to return. So then he summons his slaves. That's us. So it's nice to have the kingdom. That's great. That's wonderful. But what about you? What are you doing so that when Jesus meets you in the judgment, he'll be pleased with what you've done? So he gets his slaves together, and he gave them minas. Now, that's a huge amount of money, isn't it? 100 days' wages. A mina is equal to about... A hundred days wages. It's quite a lot of dollars. Give them ten of those. I do think we've been given a treasure. Jesus said, Are you willing to sell every field to get the one field that has the truth, has the kingdom? The treasure. I sometimes think every word we read here is worth billions of dollars. It really is. People accept it. The truth is worth far more than even some of our current political rulers and leaders have rich as they are, nothing compared with this. So, he gives them then a hundred days wages at the Mina, and that was what, ten times over, however that much money is, and he says, get busy, until I come back. You have got to do something with your talent or you won't be saved. You absolutely won't be saved. Whatever your capacity is, you have to do something with your talent. While I'm away, do business. That's then 1 Corinthians 15, just turn to that verse, the end of 1 Corinthians 15, here's a verse that is interesting. Paul says to the members there, be abounding in the work. Isn't that right? 1 Corinthians 15, the last verse, I think, Carlos, of that. Uh, be strong, stand firm, yes. maximizing your involvement ah. in the Lord's work, since you know that nothing you do in union with the Lord yes. is wasted. That's a good paraphrase. Maximize your involvement with the work. It's your own. It's rather interesting. Is it's that my translation? Oh, I don't mind that. Yet. <laughs> 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 oh, that's a very good paraphrase. Oh, that guy's good. <laughs> <laughs> Maximizing your involvement. Whoa, where did I go? I must have got that from Barbara or Sarah, obviously. I couldn't think of anything as good as that. Sorry, that was 1 uh, Corinthians 15, 15 58. Sorry. 15 58. <laughs> <laughs> maximize your involvement in whatever capacity you are able to do that. Okay, his citizens though, the ones you see, Israel, his citizens would be his people, the Jewish people, who should have welcomed him as the Messiah. They hated him, and they still do. And they sent a delegation, <coughs> delegation after him. We do not care to have this man be our king. You've got a whole lot of very lethargic people, intelligent people, who are not primarily concerned with immortality. Wake up, folks. What is this? You mean you're not interested in immortality? You're an intelligent, successful person, and you couldn't care less about Jesus, and you might even have been exposed indirectly to all the things of Jesus, and you're still not doing nothing. 
I wouldn't want to be in those shoes. Because to much to him, to whom much is given, much is expected. And Jesus said in John, I love this text, in John 15, he said twice, if I had not come and spoken to you, you wouldn't be guilty. But now that Jesus has come into your life, then you are on the line. It was no good when I said to the officer who stopped me for speeding, said I was going 75 miles an hour when I wasn't supposed to. I said, well, the sign on the road says 80. <laughs> well, that was the number of the highway. <laughs> Bad excuse. We are culpable only to the point that we can reasonably have guilty. But the more we know, the more trouble, I suppose. So, anyway, that's an, another thought. We move on. His citizen, Hazen, we don't want him to be king over us. Fifteen, when he returns, is this difficult? Is this hard? Is this complicated? Of course not. He's gone off to get the right to rule. Now, when he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he got authority to rule. I see it. He ordered that his servants, to whom he'd given all of this talent, this money, be called, summoned to him, so that he might find out what business they had done. Had they maximized their involvement or not? So the first one shows up and says, Rabbi, <coughs> Master, your mean, it was your money you gave me, has increased tenfold. And he said to him, well done, Jesus. No. Oh, well done, Jesus. We get that. I'm tired of this. Oh, isn't God great? I see that. I get that. But it's not what Jesus said here. He said, well done, you, 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 and you. Well done. You done good. <laughs> Did I say that right? No, it was agony for you. Sorry to butcher your language. <laughs> I'm trying to get the point over. Well done. Good servant. So we're all servants. We are servants of the public. We are servants of the public. Good servants. And servants of God and Jesus. Because you have been faithful in a very little thing, really. You are now to be in authority over ten cities. And people say, spiritual! <laughs> this is a memorable saying we had from Cain. Who's interested in a piece of spiritual pie? I'd rather have the real thing. <laughs> spiritual ice cream. There you go. And I say, Barbara, can I please have some briars tonight? <laughs> well, no. You can have spiritual ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Right. Isn't it, is it, I mean, do we need exhortation? What's difficult about this? Is this complicated theological stuff? Are we parsing the Greek words? Heaven forbid. This is easy stuff. It's just hard to do. You don't need, I mean, what can you say? You could read it in 15 different paraphrases. It would all be utterly clear. My concern is those people in this world who are not reading their Bibles, they're not interested in this. They'd better be. Why not? What is so bad? They're very interested in everything else. Mm -hmm. They're interested in the American dream. They're making good money. They're doing this and that. They're very intelligent people. But they are not paying attention to what God says, which is the only thing that counts. The rest is futile. Okay, you take charge of ten cities. I take it it means that. What else would it mean? Can maybe ask Kate to explain this spiritual? <laughs> what are the ten cities? Would that be, uh, what would that be? You're going to have nice lunch for ten days. No, no, no. <laughs> You're going to have ten pairs of new shoes, heaven forbid. Oh dear. No, I don't think so. Take charge of ten cities. And this dear student who asked us on the last day of Christian Working Seminary said, who are we going to rule over? <laughs> Read this? <laughs> there are going to be cities. I take it they would not just be houses. I take it there would be people. <laughs> shall, we, shall we struggle over that? <laughs> spiritual people. Spiritual people. <laughs> <laughs> there will be spiritual cities. Ghost towns. Yeah. Ghost towns. Ghost towns. Literally ghost towns. So there are human mortals in this coming kingdom surviving. They survive. They're allowed into the kingdom because they're repenting when they see the cataclysmic things at the end of the age. They're not ready to be immortalized as we Christians uh, will be in the resurrection. Another fair question yes. to add to yep. people is when Jesus promises the same thing to his 12, yes. he says, you will govern the yes. 12 tribes. Are they thinking, oh, 12 spiritual tribes? Or, I mean, 
Certainly. Maybe spiritually governing I spiritual trust. Obviously, they're, they're all people, right? I love the, re the realism of the Bible. It is so unphilosophical. It is so non-waffly, isn't it? It's real life. Ten cities, you take charge of them. You're going to be their servant because, as even our, some of our potentially elected people today have a sense of they can serve Ohio in a greater capacity. I think they understand that. They, they do get it. But we're talking about the kingdom of God here. Can you take charge of ten cities? Can you then teach them how to live? Are you well instructed enough to know how they should be taught? This is what we're learning to do. So we're trying to set some sort of example. I hope before that. Second then, you know the story. Five times over. Is it, sorry Anthony, is it fair to see here uh, uh, three types of people? Sure. The, the faithful, right. the lukewarm, right. So they're, yeah, they, they're not outright enemies, hostile, but they're lukewarm in their management of, of the talents, and thus they, they're spat out as, as another person. And the outright enemies, is that fair to Well, no, I think, I think the, the people who get the five cities are, have done okay. Yeah. No, I mean, the one, I'm talking really. about the one who yeah. did receive the talent, yeah, but he said, I oh, no, were a severe they're, guy. They're in trouble. And, yeah, they're in trouble. So they're sort of, they're not enemies, they're no. believers of some no, kind, no, but they don't do as they're supposed to do. No, because um, I was reading, and I'm not saying, yeah, obviously, yeah. that MacArthur's got this all going on, but he's talking about um, this guy and how he was addressing, I fear you, a craven fear, yes. not born out of love or reverence, but tainted with contempt no. for his master. Uh, and that he references Matthew 25 24. Yes. He, had he had any true regard for the master, a righteous fear would have provoked diligence rather than sloth. So he was contemptuous. He was doing better. like, oh, you, you know, I know how great you are. No, he, he didn't like this guy. And it also said that he had no proof the things that he accused him of of his heart, you know, being right. a, a very right. nasty master, that he just said that. There was no proof of that. But he did, see, the, the thing, uh, that is one interpretation. Yeah, and I like mean, I said, it's... But the weird thing here is that this guy, if we read a verse... Which, which guy are you talking the about? The guy here, verse 20, starting in... Okay. The uh, handkerchief. He's in bad shape. There's no mission about him. He's in great, very, verse, very good. Verse 22 uh, uh, I will judge you. Deposit, uh, why did, so Jesus says, Why then didn't you put my money in the bank so that when I return I could have collected it with interest? Yeah. So it's not even that he stole the money. No, he didn't. He just hid it. No, he didn't. Yeah, but you're, you're whitewashing here. Let's go to Matthew 25. With great respect. <laughs> Let's go to Matthew 25. And you'll see what happened to the guy who did nothing with the talent. Are you ready for this? Verse 26, Matthew 25. This is the one who hid the talent. His master answered and said to him, "You wicked, lazy slave." You ought to put my money in the bank, so that on my arrival, therefore take away the talent from this person and give it to one who has ten. And then the worthless slave in 30, what happened to him? In verse 30, what does it say? Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing. Let's get this clear. The one who does nothing with his talent is not saved. This has been preached wrong by people who try to walk away. I mean, he's weeping. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. weeping and actually tea. Yeah. Right. This is this is, a, this is a believer, right? A believer who didn't. It's do a failed believer. It's right. a fail. Of course. Right. Right. The parable is about all of the believers, but the ones who did nothing with their talent okay. are not saved. I mean, this is a tough statement. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I was getting yeah. at. I mean, this sort of the lukewarm, what they call a lukewarm yeah. Christian, I guess. Same sort of thing as the lukewarm Laodiceans in Revelation. Right. But it's quite clear from the Matthew passage there, this lazy chap gets nowhere. So only the two categories get in. The one who did tenfold, the one who did fivefold, they get in. This must surely stress the importance of what we do. Well, now, it goes, you know, it goes hand in hand also with the one you always bring up about yeah. Lord, Lord, didn't we? Yeah, it's it's of course. I mean, of course. All of them, yeah. Same. They are certainly... Uh, 
No, those people actually, they They're thought they believers. were believers. They, thought they, they were weren't. Believers. But the one who was, who started off, was certainly a believer, did nothing with the test. Slightly different, but the result is the same, isn't it? Yeah. They fail. Okay, this is interesting stuff. What else we got here? That's the bad guy. 24, then he said to the bystanders, take the mean away, and they protest, you know, well, he's a... That's uh, quite clear, I think. So, 26, I tell you, now this is Jesus' summary then. He raises his voice at this point to make it absolutely clear. I tell you, let me tell you this. To everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. That's a very clever way to teach, may I say, because it's a contradiction there. Contradiction in quotes, if you like, if you like. Let me read it again. I tell you, to everyone who has, more will be given. So he's got something, but actually he's got nothing. If you don't do anything with the little that you have, you're going to lose even that and have nothing. So you, on the one hand, you've got something, you're not doing anything with it. It's just as bad as if you had nothing. The mind of Messiah is very clever here. He makes a salient point. I've got a cross-reference, Luke 8, yeah. 18. What does that say? To those who have received, mm -hmm. more will be given. Yes. From those who do not receive, yep. even what they think they have yep. will be taken away. Same from thing. He said it twice, apparently. Luke 8, 18, and here in uh, Luke 26. Now, yes. this verse I don't really need to stress because we've made a fuss about this already. But those who didn't want me to rule over them these are the out and out ones who never were disciples at all. I mean, they just didn't get started. The one we're just talking about just now got started. Some believe for a while, Luke 8, 13, and then they fall away. These people were against, from the start, these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and execute them in my presence. Yeah, that's awful. This Jesus is hard to get your mind around. Don't you think? You have to think about this. So, that's vengeance is mine, I will repay, but that's not our job now. What is the worst that Paul did for a, a bad chap in the church? He named it. Alexander the Coxman has done me a great, of harm, great deal of harm. Uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus are misleading people by saying, he names them, by saying the resurrection has already happened. That's preterism or bordering, flirtery, flirting with preterism. So Paul actually names them. He says, mark those who call, cause divisions. But what happened to the man then who was having relationships with his mother-in-law, or even mother? Don't have the communion with him. Don't even eat with him. But don't kill him. No right to execution. Excommunication. Excommunication is the worst that can be done. However, God and Jesus then can execute people, literally. Just some... Uh questions here? Yep. What else? Online? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Randy, mm -hmm. interesting that all received the same number of minas, not according to their ability, as in the talents, in okay. Luke 25, uh, 15. Is this significant? I don't know. I thought they got different amounts here. Did I misread yeah, that? In this passage yeah. we've been reading, I thought some got five and some got ten. Am I right? Right. And the one in Matthew, they'll uh, get this. No. There's another parable where they all get the same. Okay. Oh, is that what he's I think Randy's uh, referring to another one. The other one in Luke, is it? <coughs> so, uh, Dennis Baldwin says, Can anything be made from the King James in Matthew 25, 15, which says, And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several abilities. Oh, yes, okay. Uh, yes, let's read that one here in NAC. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. So <clears throat> different amounts of talents here, according to their own ability. I think absolutely. People have different capacities for doing different things, all different. You cannot expect one person to do the same degree of work how many people can parallel Luke writing 33% of the New Testament? You're not going to be able to do that. So according to your capacities, your talents, several abilities, I like that, according to their individual abilities, it's exactly right, that's what the talents are given. Each person within, obviously, his capacity. Just like green card people cannot run for, 
for president. That's, that's no fault of them, they can't do it. It's an extreme. Well, that's a good translation of several. Very good. Buildings. Several individual, in modern English, according to their individual, uh, several things, the King Jamesism, like God gives the gift severally, you know. <laughs> Very confusing. Don't read the King James, of course, these days, mostly. Beautiful translation in its way, but frightfully foggy and confused in many places, and plain wrong in First John 5, 7. However, oh, that's another subject to tell you. And of course, God is the one who has the ability of course. each person. Yes. He's the one that gave them their That's exactly right. That's a good point, because we should not judge adversely, condemn each other for not doing this, that, and the other. Each person has to, I think, examine themselves and say, what can I reasonably do? I, I do get the impression that a lot of Christians are not really engaged in the subject. They're showing up at church every Sunday, but beyond that it doesn't go very far. They're not reading anything that's dangerous these days. They're not reading anything. They're not really concentrated on the effort. Some people have a prayer ministry. I've seen that. I, I won't mention the name, but there's a lady out there who prays very, very earnestly for people you know, all the time and phones us from time to time. So different capacities, I see that. Another comment from Neil yeah. B. Neil B. The corporate church system promotes mm -hmm. and rewards non-effort from the sheep. <laughs> like the Greyhound bus jingle, go church and leave the driving to us. Go to church, yes, that's quite good. Yeah. 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 Go to church and leave the driving. <laughs> <laughs> She's got to don't do nothing because we're going to do it all for you. Yeah, that's great. That's good. Neil. Neil. Whoever Neil B is, that's a good... I hope somebody's in their notes taking these marvelous statements like, I don't it's a spiritual ice cream or pie. I like the real thing. <laughs> okay, that's uh, the story. Is this a marvelous chapter though? I think it's absolutely brilliant because it does the kingdom thing so well. Then it does, what do we do in response to the kingdom message? That's Luke 19. We've got a bit more to do, but oh no, we haven't got to stop him. Yeah. Yeah. He, then he was going on ahead to Jerusalem to die eventually. This is for next week. Next week? Yes. The following week will be absent. Robin will be with us. Robin Todd will That's ask him to address us. That'll be excellent. Yes. If you want to go to a nice Peachtree Wind Band concert, that's on Friday at 7 o'clock at St. Paul's Lutheran Church over there in Peachtree City. Uh, nice concert easy to listen to music that's on Friday next at 7 o'clock in the Lutheran Church where, where we rehearse every Monday a lot of things happening good